What we're going to be looking at this morning is the most famous conversion story in the history of the world. It's widely considered to be one of the most cru crucial events uh, in the history of God's dealing with humanity. As far as conversion stories or testimonies go, they are diverse. There are no patterns or templates. They are as unique as the person that God is reaching out to. They, they are not all sudden. They are not all dramatic. But this one definitely is. However, we're not going to be looking at this narrative strictly as a conversion story. We'll be discovering that it's also the road to recovery. Open your Bible this morning to Acts chapter 9. The book of Acts chapter 9. Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee from the school of Gamaliel. That would be like Harvard or Yale or Princeton as far as religious tradition was concerned. Saul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Uh, in the previous chapter, he is consenting to the stoning execution of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. But as the persecution increased... So did the effectiveness of the church and the spread of the gospel. By the time we get to Acts chapter 9, Saul is hell-bent on dragging Christians out of their homes into the streets to imprison them and even execute them. Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Uh, Saul, the Pharisee, goes to the high priest. Don't let that detail get by you. The high priest was the ranking member of the ruling body known as the Sanhedrin, which was made up of Sadducees. There was division and angst and envy between Pharisees and Sadducees. For Saul to go to them was an indication of the extreme measures he was willing to go to in order to stamp out this menace known as the way because they weren't yet widely known as Christians. Why, why go to those extremes? Why in prison? Why, why the stoning of Stephen? Because the idea that God could become a human being, the idea of a crucified Messiah, the idea that God would set aside the temple and the sacrifices like Stephen preached, that was an impossibility according to Saul's thinking. As far as he was concerned, it was heresy, it was blasphemy, it was an affront to his God, and it had to be stopped by any means necessary. You see, Saul of Tarsus thought he knew who God was, but he didn't. Despite years of studying at the top school, and before that, being born into the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day by devout parents and studying the Torah and the Talmud all of his life, he thought he knew who God was, but he didn't. How many people today think they know who God is, but they don't? Ready? How many of us think we know who God is, but we don't? Saul studied the scriptures, all Pharisees did. You know, Pharisees had to have the Torah, the first five books of your Bible, memorized. That means, and watch me here, that means you can know the scriptures and not know God. Let me say that again. You can know the scriptures and not know God. Now follow me. You, you cannot know God without knowing the scriptures, but you can know the scriptures strictly in a cerebral and academic sense and miss God by a million miles. The, the, the devil knows how to quote the Bible. And there are mean-spirited, vindictive, and hateful people in the church who weaponize Bible verses to try to hurt people. Can I just tell you, that is despicable, it is inexcusable, let me just say it like it is, it's demonic. 
later, not Saul the Pharisee, but Paul the Apostle, he would write to his son in the faith, his protege, Timothy, and he would say this. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. The, the, the purpose of the command, the purpose of the scripture is not simply memorization in your head, but transformation in your heart. The Bible's not for information. The Bible's for inner spiritual formation. The end, the goal. Listen, memorization is a means to the end, but it is not the end in and of itself. The end, the goal, the result should be a pure heart, a good conscience, and authentic faith. The psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. What Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee in Acts chapter 9, what he has is a God he has constructed. A God that he has manufactured. A God that he has made. And when all you have is a misinformed construction of your own making, then all you really have is a projection of your preferences. And if all you have is a God of your own making, then it cannot help you, it cannot heal you, it cannot deliver you, it cannot save you. And a projection of your preferences cannot challenge you or exhort you or correct you or confront you or contradict you, even rebuke you when necessary. And I'm just going to tell you, we all need that. We don't need false gods, mythical gods of our own making. You don't need a projection of your preferences. He, listen, he cannot just be a product of your whims and your desires and your needs. You need the one true God because it is by knowing the truth that you are made free. Saul knows the scripture, but he doesn't know God. He has a God of his own making. So what does he need to get on the right path? To get on the right road? To start a journey toward truth? He needs a collision, and he's about to get one. Verse 3. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. What knocked Saul to the ground? Was it the light? Now, it was a supernaturally brilliant light. It was a light like the Old Testament Shekinah glory of God. When Paul recounts his conversion experience in other places, he says that this happened at noonday. So this light is significantly, if not exponentially, brighter than the noonday Middle Eastern sun. But was it the light that knocked him to the ground? No, it wasn't, because the two thoughts are separated grammatically in your Bible. Was it the voice of the Lord? No, he hit the ground before the voice of the Lord even said anything. What knocked Saul to the ground was the awesomely powerful presence of Jesus, ready, and the truth. Saul has a collision with Jesus and a collision with the truth. In an instant, this young zealous Pharisee is cosmically confronted with several things. In an instant, he knows, okay, he was wrong about God. He was wrong about the Messiah, so he doesn't know anything that he thought he knew. Everything he's done in defense of God has been wrong. Therefore, his entire identity has been wrapped up in a falsehood. His life's work means absolutely nothing at best. And the list goes on and on and on. And when he realizes it in a flash, when the, when, when the proverbial light comes on, the presence and power and truth of who Jesus is knocks him into the ground. Sometimes the truth has a way of laying you low, humbling you. Someone once said, facts are stubborn things. 
When you come to the blunt realization that you don't even know what you don't know about someone you thought you knew but you actually don't and that someone is God or that someone is yourself, it can humble you instantly. And by the way, that's not just a good thing, that is a great thing. It's a necessary thing. You see, the road to recovery begins with a collision. Saul's? Wait a second. If Jesus of Nazareth is not a dead insurrectionist, a crucified rebel, but, but he's alive, if he is resurrected and ascended, if he is talking to me now as one born out of time, if Jesus is Lord, then what have I been doing? How have I been behaving? What, what was I thinking? And because of the preordained purpose of God, because of the love of Jesus Christ, because of the grace and mercy and compassionate care of the Lord, ready? The resurrected Christ replies to Saul's contempt by engaging him in conversation. Jesus has the ability to separate Saul's wrong and dangerous and hurtful and thoroughly jacked up ideas from his God-given value and worth. Hmm. If we could regain that ability, if we could once again rediscover that art form and understand that empathy is not an endorsement. Let me say that again. If we could just understand that empathy is not an endorsement. That loving the person and agreeing with their principles or their politics are two different things. But loving the person is immeasurably more important and infinitely more Christ-like. That just because someone sees something differently than the way that you do yeah, and you consider them to be flat out wrong that doesn't make them any less human if we could regain that outlook see people through that lens again if we could learn to listen again and listen to understand rather than listen to reply our nation our neighborhoods all of us could could at least begin to get back on the road to recovery. Listen, my family, Jesus shed his blood and died for everyone, everyone, not just the people who believed like he did. Everyone is precious in his sight. Even Saul's. Look at it again, in the middle part of verse 4, where Jesus says, Saul, Saul, he would have said it in the Hebrew tongue, he would have said, Shaul, Shaul. He said his name twice. Again, you hearken back to the Old Testament. God does that with Abraham. He does it with Moses. He does it for emphasis. He does it for calling. He does it at, at, at divine moments. Shaul, Shaul. Why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Now, sometimes in your Bible, when somebody, especially in the New Testament, says, Lord... It, on occasion, they're saying, sir, or a term of respect. That's not what Saul is doing here. He's saying, Lord, kurios. The one who is speaking to me is the Lord. Then the Lord said to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So when the church was taking the hit, Jesus was feeling the pain. When, when, when somebody treats you poorly, when somebody persecutes you, when someone is unjust towards you, it is Jesus who takes it very personally. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. A goad was a shepherd's stick. Uh, it, was, it, it was pointy on one end. Because... Let's just face it, sheep are not the intellectual giants of the animal kingdom. Um, they need to be goaded. Sheep are stupid. Sheep aren't open to reason. 
If a stream of clean water is over there, they want to go over there. So they need to be goaded. If green pastures are over here, they want to go over there, eat poison berries, and fall off of a cliff. So they need to be goaded. Have you ever been goaded by God? Sure you have. Sure you have. You, you, you've been goaded when you wanted to do the wrong thing, when you wanted to go the wrong way, when you wanted to say something ridiculous, when you were headed towards a cliff because you were overreacting again, when you were being selfish, inconsiderate, greedy, rebellious. God goaded you. God goads you because he loves you. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he corrects, he rebukes, he pricks. God goaded Saul over and over again. Maybe when he took the coats of those who were about to stone Stephen, he felt a, a prick. Maybe when he engaged in judgmental conversation with the other Pharisees, or maybe when he wouldn't take the advice of his elder, the good Gamaliel, who had a more level-headed approach to things. Maybe when he dragged men and women and children out of their homes, he felt a prick. He felt something prick his seared conscience. He had a little bit of doubt about what he was about to do. He had some trepidation. He had some hesitancy in his heart. He was being prompted by God pricking him. But he ignored the goad and then experienced the guilt. By the way, when you ignore the goad, you will experience the guilt. He ignored the goad. He experienced the guilt, and he had to ignore them both the next time he went and did it. Don't ignore the goads. Heed the goads. Don't kick against the pricks. Respond to God's goads. God goads you for good. <laughs> to lead you to green pastures and still and restful waters, God goads you to restore your soul. Pick it up in verse 6 with me. So he, Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord... What do you want me to do? What a great response. I, I'll tell you right now, I think there's some of us sitting in front of our device this morning that need to say that exact same thing. Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go. <laughs> uh, it's, it's good that you humbled yourself. It's good that right now, particularly since all that you've been doing has been all wrong, that you're licking the dust right now. It's good that your face is in the dust right now, but I love you and I don't want you to remain there. I don't want you to remain in that state. I want you to rise up to ever-increasing levels of faith and effectiveness and fruitfulness. I want you to arise and go. Arise and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice... But seeing no one, how many of you know that sometimes when God speaks to you, it's just for you? It's just for you. It's not for everybody else. It's not for the spectators. It's not for the bystanders. It's just for you. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So why did God temporarily blind Saul? Saul couldn't see. He also didn't eat or drink the most intense kind of fast for three days. Why? Because Saul needed to think. He needed a time of uninterrupted and unimpeded reflection. Because seeing, he couldn't see. So God had to take his physical sight for a minute so that he could gain spiritual sight for eternity. Th th then he'd be ready to see physically again, but then he'd see everything differently. For three days, Saul was rethinking his entire understanding of God in, in his physically blind state. He starts seeing things that he's never seen before. Think about it. Uh, he goes from a light radically more brilliant than the sun into total darkness. 
You ever do that? Ever do that? Ever, have you ever been in a really bright place and all of a sudden go into a totally dark room and you can't see anything at all? You can't even see your hand in front of your face? At first, you see nothing at all. But then, at first, your pupils are too constricted, so you can't see anything at all, right? That you, can't, you can't recognize even the tiniest amount of lights that may be in a very dark place. But over time, what happens? Your pupils begin to adjust. They become bigger. They take in more light. All of a sudden, you start to see shadows and shapes. And if you wait long enough, you start to see a lot of things that you didn't when you first came into the room. That's what's happening to Saul. The pupils of his soul are dilating. He's seeing things he's never seen before. My family, listen to me carefully. When things are dark, just wait a little while. Wait on the Lord. And think, reflect, renew your mind. You see, it's important to not let anyone else do your thinking for you. Oh my goodness, I have to say that again. It is important to not let anybody else do your thinking for you. Listen, you can't look on somebody else's paper. You have to do your own intellectual homework. Because Christianity is not a check your brain at the door religion. It's being, you know what the Bible says? It's being renewed in the spirit of your mind. We, we live in a world where persuasion is pervasive. And it often goes unchecked and even undetected. We, we get so used to CNN or Fox News or MSNBC telling us what to think. You know, I'll tell you a funny story. It was during one of the debates. And uh, I don't remember which debate, but Pastor Lane and I were... were uh, Staying up for the debates. I think they started at 9 p.m. And, and you know, that's, that's just shortly before our bedtime. We're like the early to bed, early to rise people. So by 9.30, we're headed upstairs. And so we're trying to stay awake through one of the debates. And we're not succeeding. You know, we're both at different times, you know, dozing off. And I'm looking over at her. And she's looking. At her. And so I just said to her, you know, let, let's just go to bed. Let's just go to bed. And she said, no, no, I really... I really want to stay up and watch this. I said, don't worry. We'll get up in the morning. We'll turn on the news and they'll tell us what to think. <laughs> we get so used to the, the people and sources we have chosen to surround ourselves with and to speak into our hearts on social media that we get ourselves siloed. I have some homework for you this week. At least once this week. And if you want to go all in, do it every day. But shut off the TV. Shut out the pundits. Go off the grid on social media. And, and do it for at least one hour. If you can do more, do more. If you can do it for an hour and a half, great. If you can do it two, three hours, wonderful. And do not let anyone but God speak to you. Take it, you and Jesus, period. Take your Bible, take a pen and a pad so you can write what, what, what God tells you so that you can write it down. But take nothing else. Turn the phone off. Talk to the Lord. And let the Lord talk to you. Saul had three days. And then he had three years in Jerusalem. Do you know it wasn't until 14 years later that he goes on his first missionary journey and writes his first epistle. And during that time of preparation for the separation to his ultimate calling, he, listen, he didn't let anybody else do his thinking for him. He spent time with the one who loved him enough to goad him. He, he spent time with the one who loved him enough to blind him. He spent time with the one who loved him and gave himself for him. And that, that's the road that led Saul the Pharisee to become Paul the Apostle. Verse 10 says this. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. 
And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go. Isn't that interesting? Same exact thing he told Saul. Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas. Okay, pause there for just a moment because i got to communicate this. Do you see the detailed instruction that Ananias receives from the Lord? Do you, do you hear? Go to this street and to this house. He's that detailed in his instruction to Ananias. Do you remember when Noah built the ark? Do you remember how Noah received the different dimensions and the different building materials to exact specifications so that that thing would float when the flood would come? I'm here to tell you today that Noah did not have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of him and still heard God to that level of detail. Ananias hears the Lord speak to him to that level of detail and you can hear God speak to you to that level of detail. Go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus for behold he is praying. See that's what Saul's been doing for three days. Praying, contemplating, rethinking, making connections he's never made before. God became a man. How could God become a man? And suddenly the Lord leads him to Genesis chapter 3, where there would be the seed of a woman. Capital S, seed of a woman, a virgin birth. For unto us, Isaiah 9, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. The son would be given. And his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Oh my goodness. God can become a man. But how could the Messiah, the military Messiah, I believed in all my life, how could he be a suffering servant? Well, he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement for our peace was placed upon him. Zephaniah says, we looked upon his hands and his feet and they were pierced. He starts to make the connections. And then it says this in verse 12, and in a vision... God is speaking again to Ananias. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So God tells him, I'm giving you a vision and I'm giving him a vision. I'm giving double vision, simultaneous vision. I'm confirming my plan with a double vision. Then Ananias answered, Lord... I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my sake. I got to tell you, I love the honesty of this passage. I love the honesty of Ananias. Y you know, we all have to have an Ananias in our lives, and we all have to be an Ananias to someone. Jesus gives him detailed instructions, and Ananias replies, wait up, Lord. This guy is a jerk. This guy is a, he's, he's part of the opposition. He's on the wrong side of history. His views are all wrong. This guy is an extremist. This guy is a terrorist. And now he's got letters. He persecutes people like me. He de delegitimizes people like me. He arrests people like me. He imprisons people like me. He executes people like me. And Jesus says, here's what I'm going to need you to do. I'm going to need you to set aside yourself and trust me. God invites us into situations where we are to set aside ourselves and trust him. Jesus' response to Ananias' reluctance, his reluctance to reach out, what does Jesus do? Jesus says to him, listen, you have more in common than you know. You have more in common than you know. You have more in common than you're aware of, Ananias. You're a Jew and he's a Jew. You're chosen, he's chosen. You're a vessel of mine, he's a vessel of mine. You're praying, he's praying. 
You're hearing from me. So is he. You, you guys are so different that you're the same. Ananias, you don't even know what I've been doing behind the scenes in his life. You don't know what I've been doing in his heart. You heard about the letters, but you didn't hear about the light. Maybe your source of information has been selective. Your knowledge is limited, but my love is limitless. You, you only know a very limited part of the story, a very small part of the story. And I wrote the story. I wrote your story. I wrote his story. I write all the stories. I am the author and the finisher. And I wrote both of your stories and confirm it with a simultaneous double vision so that your roads would intersect to change the world. Now go. Do you hear the Spirit of God? Do you hear Him saying it to you? Arise and go. Re replace the contempt with the conversation. Listen to understand, not to rebut. Get out of your silo. Mute the noise. There's more common ground than you know. Find it. Rediscover it. Because you live in a shared reality where love never fails. And remember, the enemy, the accuser, the father of lies, the ultimate divider and sower of discord wants to keep you off of the road of re to recovery. Listen, the last thing the serpent wants is the church to be in one accord because he knows we are unstoppable when we are of one heart and one mind. Know this. The road to recovery is paved with reaching out to people on the other side. Let me say that again. The road to recovery is paved with reaching out to people on the other side. Whether it's the good Samaritan or the woman at the well in Samaria. It's what Jesus taught. It's what he modeled. It's what he embodied. It's what he inspired. And it is what he has commissioned. And when you pause and you think about it a little bit, Jesus has to goad both men. He has to correct them both. In essence, he asks them, what are you really fighting? You should be fighting the good fight of faith, not one another. I may have to blind you to open your eyes to see what's really going on. You should be waging good warfare, not warring with one another. The weapons of your warfare are not carnal. You should be crushing spiritual serpents, not one another. Ananias' response is, is awesome. And so is Saul's. In verse 17 it says this. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him. He said, Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came. Has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. I wish we had more time, but look what happens here. Lloyd Ogilvy wrote this. He said, Imagine laying your hands on someone you know had been on his way to arrest you. Ananias lays hands on he who was his sworn enemy. He lays hands. He blesses. He imparts. He anoints. He accepts. He affirms. He includes. He embraces. And then he says, Brother Saul. Ananias remembers who he is and whose he is. He remembers who his father is and he remembers who his siblings are. In the lyrics of the 
1969 hit single, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. You're not the enemy, the devil's my enemy. You're my brother, you're not my adversary, the devil's my adversary, you're my sister. You're not my competitor, you're not my opponent, you're not the opposition, you're my brother, you're my sister. We are family, biology doesn't make us family, but the blood of Jesus sure does. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has sent me that you may receive. He, he sent me not for me. He, he sent me not for a cause. He sent not, not for me to receive. He sent me for you. He sent me that you might receive. You see, the road to recovery becomes clear when you see that you were sent. That you have a God-given purpose. That you are in the kingdom for such a time as this. That Jesus is looking to you and empowering you and directing you and anointing you to lay hands, to bless, to fill, to heal, to give sight to the blind and to embrace that you were commissioned, that you were appointed by God. So someone very unlike you might receive and might be filled. My family, I cannot emphasize this enough. This encounter in Acts chapter 9 took place in 34 AD and it forever changed the world. When you look at any list of the most influential people in world history, if it has any intellectual honesty, Jesus is at the top of the list and Paul follows close behind. And now... In 2020 A.D., uh, as, as nightmarish as 2020 has been, listen, it's okay because it's our time. I said because it's our time. It's our time to see the light. It's our time to be the people who know their God are strong and carry out great exploits. It's our time to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. It's our time to be the church that the gates of hell and hatred and division will never prevail against. It's our time to fall on our knees before the glorified Christ. It's our time for the scales to fall from our eyes to rethink, reach out, restore, repair. It's time to get ourselves on and keep ourselves on the road to recovery. It's time to love God, love people, and change our world.